like that. I am live with Mr. Lee Cox from Lee Cox, all, all the way from the UK. One of the benefits of technology in today's world is we can record and connect with people around the world. Um, so, Lee, thank you very much for coming on. I think it's going to be a lot of fun, at least for me it is. Yeah, Pete, thanks for having us. Yeah, and, uh, delighted to be on. I know you've had some great guests over the period of time you've been doing it, so I'm uh, happy to be in that company and happy to be on here, yeah? Yeah, and I, I've been a very big fan and very anxious to talk to you, uh, going back to when I talked to uh, John Tattersall, who's a friend, very good friend of yours and from the UK as well, did a seminar here locally, and he said some things uh, that I found interesting that uh, he has done some work with you on, and, and you are, aside from being an exceptional coach, you are have a specialization on increasing swing speed. You're Martin Borg Myers coach, a world long drive champion, and have done some great work with him and others. Uh, you're the coach of a fella here locally, uh, Evan, who works up at Congaree, who's, mm. he told me he's hit 190 ball speed, which is pretty impressive for a guy who's mostly behind the counter and answering phones. Yeah. And, he's, a, he's, um, a, he's a big boy though, yeah? Yes, he is. Very, very, uh, light. It, for, for somebody who's not a big guy that, that yeah. is thin, but he's tall. I mean, the speeds that he can generate, it's like, Jesus, mm. <laughs> it's amazing. Yeah, he's very powerful. But, yeah, he's, he's almost a blend of a, of a pro and a long drive guy. He's a bit of a mixed guy, mm -hmm. yeah? But it, so selfishly for me, I've been very anxious to talk to you since John had mentioned you and the work that you did. And I watched the video of you, you and he on YouTube, which I'll post a link to that so everybody can check that out as well. But the, the work that you've done and, and as we're talking about, you know, get, getting older and I, I'm 51 now as of last week and, and trying to maintain at least maintain it or not lose, if not gain some speed that I've lost from a number of years of not playing. So uh, I think it's going to be a very, very fun conversation, at least for me. And I'm sure a lot of people out there are listening. Everybody wants to hit it longer now. Um, what, uh, I guess a very simple question, just to kind of get warmed up and appetizers. What, what kind of led you down the road of uh, increasing speed and, and hitting the ball longer? Uh, it was sort of multifactual, really. Uh, I, I was a pro, so I'm a, I'm a PGA pro for many years. Uh, and um, uh, uh, it's funny, actually. I, I, I think a bit of distance initially as a kid comes from the environment you're in. Um, so sometimes you teach someone who plays at a small course that's very tight and you get to know them and they don't hit it very far because that's the course they bought up were bought up on. So um, I, I, I had a good sports background. I come from a sporty family. And uh, as a kid, one of, my, uh, one of my great friends, still one of my great friends, me and him used to be really competitive, uh, athletics, football and all sorts of sport. He was my main sort of um, uh, uh, competitor in the area, multi-sports. So me and him started playing golf. And um, he always did it miles past me. And I, ne I never actually got the ball past him. And uh, funnily enough, we played the other week. It was a mate's 50th and I played with him and I still can't get the ball past him. <laughs> um, and then I started playing amateur golf and everyone said to me, oh, you, you hit it absolutely miles, yeah? And I thought, no, nah, no, nah, you, you haven't seen my mate. And then um, and then I turned pro and everyone said, they said, I cannot believe how far you hit it. But I only hit it miles because I, I was chasing my friend and I, I, I had reasonable dna for generating distance so i found it quite interesting that I, I hit the ball a lot further than a lot of other people but just because i was competing against my friend and then i sort of had a bit of interest in long drive and then uh, joe miller the, the the long drive champ he was the first guy outside uh, america and canada to win the world long drive his dad came to me in about the uh, early 2000s and said will you help my son have a go at long drive so i said yeah love to brilliant and then Sort of got in the car and then realised I didn't know anything about long drive at all. Yeah, so I'd, I'd agreed to something. I'd agreed to something that I had no no idea on. But uh, twenty years later, I, uh, you know, I went on a study. I, I got lucky in the first place. I got given a guy with tremendous talent who went on to win two world long drive titles. Um, so you know, I got given a blessing, but I've been able to repeat that. But I found the journey really quite interesting. Now. For those coaches maybe thinking of getting into coaching long drive, there is no there is no money in it. So um, it's something I did more of a, 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 for a, a love that I found fascinating. So I started my journey on, you know, trying to uh, uh, educate myself more fitness wise, uh, um, uh, ball flight wise. Trackman just came out a few years later. Um, no one was teaching swing speed, so I started contacting certainly in the UK people around the world and just trying to add to my knowledge, which I, I still do, you know, every week, every month. And, and you know, as, as coaches get into it, the, the, the journey and knowledge never stops. So my a bit of a long answer, but my, my, my journey came originally from having an interest. And so the last bit of that 
is that I got coached out of hitting it a long way. <laughs> I actually got in the 90s, which was the era of distance through resistance, I mm-hmm. actually, through coaching, lost my athletic genius. Not genius, but, you know, I was, I was very good athletically. And I went from a long hitter to a short hitter and was taken out of that. So then my mind sort of went down the fact that I was taught out of speed, not, not into speed. But I think that was also the time at that point in the 90s where, you know, wooden, just at the end of wooden clubs, you know, mm-hmm. couldn't really stand there and rip it. And, you know, uh, and the way the teaching was going at the moment actually took me the other way. So I think I wanted to take the journey in the reverse order then. Yeah. yeah and but back then, and just the, through equipment, um, the harder you hit it, the more the ball would spin. So yeah. it, it didn't make sense to, to, to go after it the, the way that players are now because it would just if you were into the wind it was going to go even shorter you know it was very hard to take spin off of balls back then and, and those those old balata balls as you and i would know <laughs> you're right they just added spin they were very easy to curve mm-hmm. we're using wooden clubs uh which were you know you, if you didn't hit the middle you weren't going to get a great deal out of them so i think technology in the last few years has made guys been able to stand there and pump it and the ball's much better um you know probably one maybe the early stratas has also made a difference how the game can be played. So I think that was just part of the, of, of the time. I know Faldo, uh, Nick Faldo, who was a, is a big guy, actually, and was a big hitter and, and learned how to lose distance. I think he said if, if he existed in these days, he would have had to have taken a very different approach. Yeah, uh, when you mentioned a, a, a individual's environment as they grew up, uh, I, I don't know... I don't know if it was you that I was listening to somewhere on another show or on a YouTube, but somebody had brought up the difference between Faldo, who, as you mentioned, I think he's about 6'3", and in his playing day, or in the 225 or 30 he's, pound range. You know, he was an Olympic, Olympian size athlete. Yeah. Uh, and he did not hit it very far at all. And then you had the Fred Couples. Yeah. Who, who, who's, I think Fred short of six foot and there he was bombing it but the difference was faldo i think had grown up on a driving range and or a golf course as you alluded to that was very he had to hit seven irons because he couldn't he had to go get his own balls and come back and yeah you're not going to hit pump driver out and, and couples played in in soft conditions in the pacific northwest where you had to fly it as far as you can because you were not going to get any roll yeah and i think i think actually uh, weirdly enough nick faldo was brought up about 10 minutes five minutes from here very strangely mm-hmm. Uh, and, and, and so I know the course very well. He was brought up on. There's a few long holes. Um, he actually weirdly won a couple of long drive tournaments as he first came out on tour. And somewhere along that journey, though, he did strip that back down. Certainly, the driving range where he was brought up was very, very short. So maybe that's where he got it from as well. But um, uh, you'd have to say at the time of what he did. Although I know, although I read him uh, that he said he thought he'd do it differently at the time, it was the right thing for him to do. So it mm-hmm. was obviously a good decision at that moment in time. And we know moments change. Yeah. yeah and you know, as a technological aspect and we're all familiar with launch monitors and, th- and fitting and, and drivers and, and mm-hmm. Scott Fawcett last week brought up a very interesting point. And he said, cause you know, one of his, big things is whatever shape you hit with your driver stick to it yep. so if you're going to hit a cut hit a cut if you're going to draw to draw and he said it doesn't make sense to try to work it the other way because with technology today and fitting if you're fit for a driver and you hit a draw that with the spin rates if you try to hit a cut it's going to the, the spin rate's going to skyrocket and you're not going to be mm-hmm. able to, to keep it in play and if you hit a cut and you try to draw it it's not going to stay in the air long enough it's just going to tumble so it doesn't make sense to to try to no. work your driver uh, it, if you're playing competitively or if you're trying, you know, you're trying to play at a higher level. And I agree with that entirely. And in, in my little dabbling in to try and be a pro player, that was the one thing that surprised me uh, initially that the guys, you know, they go draw, 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 fit dog leg right, I think they're going to cut it. And they just still drew it over the corner. So it wasn't quite how I thought good players did that. And I agree with Scott entirely from a fitting perspective. If you've been fit to hit one shape, uh, the fitting for the other shape is, is different. I go with that. I think he's hundred percent spot on with that. You know, one, one thing I want to get into because uh, is what's happening, or at least from our perspective in the coaching world with what, if you, if we look at what happened, uh, Victor Hovland with a short game and Joe Mayo, I think you know, they've done some phenomenal work hmm. and it is somewhat contradictory to what the modern coaching has been on, at least as far as chipping, where they're getting steeper with the angle of attack. Um, uh, and, but the spin rate is still high. It's, it, it goes, you know, contradictory. Not trying to cause more arguments in golf. I think everybody's gotten to a point now after the Alpha Wars where it's like, okay, we're all working to get 
people better. So let let's sure. keep the keep that discussion going. I, you you and and John as, as being colleagues and, and very good friends are are going a little bit against what is the conventional coaching of what Mike Adams and EA Tischler and Terry Rolls have brought forward with there's a post system that you rotate around a certain post. Although there is still a pressure shift to the trail leg, it just maybe not be as great. And there's a lead arm position based off someone's measurements or biomechanics uh, that the hand, the lead arm would be lower than the, 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 the shoulder plane equal to or higher. And you, you, your guys in the speed development are saying that there is more of a lateral component. The lateral forces play a larger role and that the hand path in getting longer, which is a component of hitting the ball further, having a longer hand path is, is higher. So if we could just jump into there and you can kind of discuss that a little bit so that maybe people who aren't following the distance coaching yeah. will so have a better understanding. If, if we started on the um, hand path, so, you know, Sasha McKenzie, um, so if I started again, if you look originally, people were following uh, the golf machines idea of power accumulators where mm -hmm. they followed in a certain sequence, there were certain power accumulators that added speed. So I think in my opinion, Sasha McKenzie's idea of angular work and linear work makes much more sense from a power perspective. Uh, linear work for those uh, sitting out there would understand. If you imagine the length of your hand travel in space, how much force you can apply upon that and the shape of that hand path has a bearing on how far you can hit it. Um, the scientists would say that linear hand path has more of a bearing on club speed than angular. Angular, if you think about it, if you watch the John Daly or a smaller version as a Dustin Johnson, angular work is rotating the club. So think about swinging it around the clock, six o'clock, nine o'clock, 12 o'clock, three o'clock, almost. But that's why long drive guys, if you've ever seen them, have long hand paths and angular work. So they swing the mm -hmm. club around the clock as well. <clears throat> now, we know there's many guys on tour who don't do that for reasons we can discuss a little bit. So my view on it is that, um, and this is from years of being in long drive, but I do teach tour players and amateurs as well, yeah, is that obviously we know length for hand path can make a bearing and applying force on that. The amount of force and the timings of it become vital. So uh, we know that the, how far you swing it uh, from a hand perspective gives you more time to generate speed and potentially more time to apply force. Now, this is where how I would see it. And um, long drive coaching is a little bit more clear cut in the fact that long drive guys always make higher swings. Um, it gives them more chance to get the club around their back, so it makes sense. A TPI call it vertical chop, where they there's a sort of karate chop motion as you move your hands down, which can mm -hmm. allow you to apply it force onto the handle, then more force on the club. And I always go back in my own brain to that linear or angular work that can be done to the club. Now, uh, also, it would make sense if, from a biomechanical perspective, if your arm was higher, as you move your shoulder forward in the downswing, that would have a pulling effect on moving your arm both forward and downwards, which can add that. So it would make sense if a person with a very high swing as they move their shoulder forward and that as that arm is moved downwards, it could apply more force. Now, I then think on tour, you've got lots of different options, yeah? So if you're yes. going to turn up for a long drive tournament, you don't want to be turning up with a flat swing, you'll be done. Because you can't <laughs> get it round your neck. You can't gain from vertical chop. Um, on 3D measuring apps, long drive guys hand pass for about 200 centimetres or two metres. Most tour guys I measure are sort of 160 so that 40 centimetres extra and upright will help. I think on tour, you've got lots of different options. We see Rory's on the flatter side, but he's very fast, but he has a long hand path. Mm -hmm. um, we see Baba, who was one of the best drivers on tour for many years, obviously is the opposite. I think for your general person at home, lengthening the hand path, whether it's in a flat or a more upright plane, can generate some speed. Uh, we know that different flexibilities and different body types might require, you know, flexing of the arm and other factors. Right. But if you just took the view that linear or how far the hands <clears throat> move in space and the force you can apply makes a difference. I think also very importantly, the, the shape of the hand path on the way down, the shape and the direction it moves also creates a good um, uh, principle in generating speed from how to get speed out to the club. 
and that hand shape is different golfer to golfer and different from irons to woods. You probably would have seen some uh, guys who could swing their irons fast and their woods not very fast, yeah? And certainly yeah, exactly. some good players, and basically they're just not managing the inertial properties of the club. Now, from um, as we were just discussing earlier, from a, from a force plate measurement, now I know a lot of force plate stuff, so one of the other things I've, I've always been good at. I'm good at finding people who are good at stuff I don't do very well. <laughs> but, <laughs> well, that, 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 that's a talent to itself. Yeah. So um, uh, I'm not very good with tech. I'm good with I'm good with um, tech that I would use like a, a flight scope or a, a track man, and I'm good mm -hmm. with 3D on apps and other bits than that. But I'm not great at grand computers. So my my great friend Steve Furlonger, I have a business with, is one of the world's leading force plate experts. And I quite, uh, he uses um, a company called Gask who make force plates, which I believe John Tattersall's got. And uh, he's developing a, a new force plate, actually a, a new force plate and uh, a markerless system with a company in Germany called Femris, which is coming out soon, which is seriously good. So I like their principle in that they have three forces. So if I can just move my chair away, Pete. So uh, they've got the medial lateral or right to left. Mm-hmm. They can measure the up and downs, which are the vertical. So for anyone at home, you've got your right to lefty stuff, you've got your up and down stuff, and then you've got your anterior posterior, which cranks your rotation. One of them drives this, this frontal plane torque, this windmill, and one of them drives the horizontal plane torque, uh, which is comes from the AP forces. Now, I like this the, the, the gas way of measuring it, where they turn that into a total torque number. Huh. So That's when we look at it from a long drive perspective, so uh, the king of long drive, the king of the king of uh, golf, Jack Nicholas, the king of long drive, Jason Zubak, has the highest medial lateral force ever measured. And then you look at uh, Martin Borgmeyer, I think, has got one of the biggest AP forces ever measured. Hmm. And then you've got Justin James, American guy, won the long drive. Yep. He's got probably the highest vertical force ever measured at three hundred percent. So what you'll find is with those guys, those guys, they do things well. So Martin Borgmeier's vertical, when he came to see me, was like 180%. To give you an idea, 160 on tour is good. 180 is low for a long drive guy. He's up to about 220, 230, but it's not off the planet. But his AP force is back and front are. So if you put that in the mix with that in the mix and that in the mix, you've got a total torque number. And I think it's a very interesting way to look at that, Pete. So sometimes people do well moving side to side. Uh, Jason Zubak was a good friend of mine. The King, Justin James, the Vertical King, Martin Borgmeier, the AP. Just imagine putting all three of them, three of them together. <laughs> It'd be the golf Godzilla of the long yeah, drive. Exactly. So I think um, that's something that, that, that as, as I followed my good friend Steve with, has become an interesting way to look at that. And then from my point of view, then how do you get all of that stuff out to the end of the golf club? Because, mm -hmm. you know, you can also produce good ground forces and still not swing the club that far. So I think they're a big part of the jigsaw. <clears throat> and there's always the argument, that obviously, the, the, the ground doesn't push back at you. You're using muscle activation against the ground. So how I, how I work with Steve these days, I think I'm really, really good on video. I think I'm really, really good. And I'll get someone to the point of where I can't see much of the other stuff, the timings, the amount of force, I then put them to my friend and he'll then give me the, the stuff I can't see. When do the movements happen? When don't they happen? What's the quantities? And then I find that. Now, if I was a coach 30 years younger, I might put them on the Steve first because I don't know the other, the other bit. So I think that, that that's part of the journey. So um, ground force reactions, um, I'm very interested in. I like to get measured. Uh, the quantities are interesting, but even maybe more interesting are the timings. Okay. And then secondly from that, how does that end up getting into the club from a, a linear and an angular point of view? Yeah, that, that's interesting that, that those three long drive guys, that the th th three of the best of all time, that, that they all have different peak forces or, or they're, they're exceptional at, at one segment, one of the three. And, and, as we discuss this and, and try to push this conversation forward in, in taking, let, let's call it the Adam system, that, that if, if there is a post system that 
and, and there's a couple factors based off of grip type and things that, that, that he advocates for. And I think if I understand his system correctly, and someone will probably comment and say, no, you have this wrong. Of course, it's, hmm. it's social media. But I think I have it fairly well. It, depending on the trail hand grip will play somewhat of a role in your forces coming down. So if you have a weaker trail hand, a la, I think a Ricky Fowler would be an example, or, or let, let's say a Matt Wolf. You know, he's going to have a lot of vertical forces because his, 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 his trail hand's pushing down, and he's going to counteract that by pushing mm. up off the ground. Uh, D, DJ, I think, would have lateral and rotational because he's got the – obviously, his, his lead arm is high at the top of the swing, and then he has yeah. a strong grip, so he's, he's going to do both. But I, I think that there's it is we is things like this happen where you, experts like you talk about it, and then you know the the, uh, the Adams camp has a chance to look at that and say, yeah, the, you know what they're doing is correct, and maybe if we tweak this, or or maybe it just goes back to well, we were saying all along that certain people are going to be better better yeah. at certain things based off their physical structure. Uh, uh, I think looking at that, so I, I'm very I'm very open minded. So and again, uh, you know, as I say, I teach them, but get, getting into long drive many years ago. Um, you look at some of their swing, you think, well, oh, and this, this is a bit of coaching. You think, I, I need to understand why that works before I try and work out why it doesn't work. <laughs> uh, and I think when you're young as a coach, you think, well, that doesn't look right, I'll change that. But it was an interesting thing because things are, you know, uh, I got into it about 2000 uh, when everyone was trying to keep their feet still, their feet are moving all over the place. So I'm thinking, oh, that's not what I've been working that's not what I've been working on. <laughs> and then, as I said, I've gone down the line. I think there's many different ways to create power. And as I said, you just now the total. I, I, I know a little bit of uh, the Adams uh, stuff, and I, I like some of those ideas. I'm certainly not against it. And my view is, is that there's different ways of putting bits together. And if you yeah. put it all in the hat, and I think that can be bespoke to each person, I think there's a little magic recipe for everyone. And I think, you know, talking. Like, like we talked 10 minutes ago, that um, when you get a player driving it well, I think on track, man, there's a sort of magic recipe, whether it's four right, two left, that's the shot. And I think when you find someone's good recipe, and that could be for track man numbers or force plate numbers, uh, and they play their best golf with that recipe, it's always a good place to get them back to. Yeah, th there, there's one thing. It was my theory before I started, and, and this was – I had the idea for the podcast many years ago before mm. I started. I, I just got, I sat on it, not because, well, partially because I was scared to death about jumping into a, a, yeah. a realm that I had no idea how it worked. Uh, but I eventually just said, hell with it. I'm just going to jump in. Cause I, I, I had at least access to a lot of people from my career, both coaching and playing that I said, well, these people, they, they need to have a voice that they can get their information out there. Cause it's some great information and they're just not good marketers. You cannot become phenomenal at what you do. can spend all the time required to do that whatever it is, and then become, be a great marketer too. It's very few people on the planet that can do that. Very true. Um, so I, I thought, well, I have access to these people. Why don't I start this podcast and, and do this? But my theory was going in and this was really coming out of the, when, when the tech was making a big push, sort of getting closer to the end of that, that era, I'm going to say seven, seven, eight years ago, uh, where everybody had jumped on and said, tech is going to change it. And tech has changed. It's allow us to measure, you know, the, the force plates and, and the pressure and everything that, that your business partner does. Um, but my, my theory was, yeah, it's going to tell us what, what the great people do, but still going back the, number one, there are certain things that we can't measure because hmm. technology hasn't caught up to that point, but everybody still is unique and individual in their own way. And they're going to swing a certain way. So they're not going to fit into a, any type of model, the same way that people didn't fit into a swing model of a David Ledbetter or a model of somebody else. And certain people did, you can't argue Nick Price and Nick Faldo's success or David Frost's success or some other players. And I'm, I'm sure there, there's a line of, if you just list, read social media, there's a line of people who don't like Ledbetter's ideas mm -hmm. and theories. And they say, well, they, he wrecked these guys. Well, it just wasn't meant for them. We didn't know how to differentiate 25 years ago, what was good for what. But I, I think, what we know now is with all the data, the mountains of data we have mm. is it's like where we started only have more data. It's like, well, we know that people are individual and they have to do things a certain way and, and we can't just lump them into these silos. So it's like we uh, come full circle, but we have a lot more information that, that is very helpful. And, and uh, I think so. You know, it's a bit like when you get a, a track man or a flight scope for the first time, you use it, use it for every lesson. And then uh, mine sits in the back of my bay and I probably use it for 5% of my lessons because you only really bring it out when you need it. 
mm-hmm. um, where at the beginning you use it just because for the sake of using it. It's a uh, new toy. It's, it's yeah, a shiny yeah. new toy, and it's fun. Also, I think that, uh, you know, obviously it gives you information of what happened to impact, but it doesn't tell you how the hell you got there. Exactly. You have to decipher that backwards. Um, and then I think, as I said earlier, that, you know, uh, I know other coaches, so say sometimes with 3D data or force plate data, um, you could approach a coach and they'll say, you know, I'm not going to give you his data here. But my view on it, if people said to me, can you, can I have Martin Borgmeier's data? Yeah, of course you can. I'll give it to you tomorrow. You won't be able to do it, but you can have it. <laughs> and, and actually what he does might not suit you. So I actually think, you know, sometimes keeping data, because, that you know, Carl Barks, you know, you can have his data, but it doesn't mean you can do what he does. So uh, I think you have to find the thing that works best for that person their body, their age, technically what they can do and uh, um, what works for them. Yeah, um, it's interesting uh, as you talk about, can you do what they can do? And most people can't. They could sit there and they could could spend a week with you and uh, when you're working with Martin and they can go home and try to do it. And next thing you know, they're, they're in traction and physical therapy for the next six weeks because yeah. they try to do it. And, and th- I think that's the downfall of social media or the negative side is someone might read your material and they might see what Martin does and they might see what some of your other students do. And they say, well, Lee only teaches this. And I think that's bullshit. Well, <laughs> okay, well you won't, you don't know the context of it. You don't know that that's what that person needs and lee does that's why he's an expert that's why people around the world go to see him or reach out to him and i think there's two parts to that if you ever look at my instagram i never put any content on it i just post the videos and um i I think uh i like people coaches where you see them do well with many different players with many different styles Mm -hmm. and then i think that i always quite like that because then i think they're trying to work with the style that they've got and it's not always about tearing them back to the start again. It's maybe, and a bit like you know, a bit like when when people get on tour. I always think if someone gets on tour, why don't, why don't you play with that for a couple of years? See if it's or one one or two years. See if what you had got you on tour is good enough to play with and match up to the best. Then if it's not, change it. But I see a lot of people get out there. And try and change it just when they've got on tour. You might as well test to see what it's worth. And you see that in, I love my boxing and stuff. You see a lot, a lot of people become great boxers, and then they they got to they get to a top level, and then look to change their trainer straight away without actually seeing what they were doing before work well. You know, to me, and I've said this many times on here, and I hope to have him on in the future. I have the most respect for him is Mark Blackburn as yeah. as a coach, uh, because you could look at Mark uh, Mark students. They could be all lined up on the range, they're teeing off one after another, and to the to the to most people who don't know that he's working with them, that you would never think that that those students are all working with the same coach. So they they had look nothing alike in their swings. No, I like Max Hom- Yeah, Max Homa looks nothing like Ches Reeve. No. And and you would say, wow, that that's that's pretty impressive that he could take different skill levels and body types and everything and, and have the success that, that his students do. Uh, uh, Homer was excellent in the Ryder Cup the other week. Probably your mm-hmm. that player. Yeah, I don't want to talk about the Ryder Cup too no. much. I know you probably want to talk Absolutely. about it a lot. But... <laughs> I probably won't probably talk about it in two years' time, though, yeah. Um, as far I had uh, – Fast Eddie was on, Hernand, uh, Fernandez. And yeah. it, the, the, what he swings at, at, at 50-plus to me is just mind-boggling and, and with such ease. Yeah. Uh, it's, it's fun to watch him to swing. You just put on a loop and watch that thing over and over again. Uh, but, you know, we, one of the, the things that Eddie said, and I, I – uh, I believe I heard you, you mentioned as well that uh, it is better to, when someone goes out to train, first of all, that they, if you're going to train for speed, you train for speed. It doesn't matter if you hit three feet behind. It doesn't matter if you hit, if you're on a driving range practicing, you hit it four fairways over or you top it or whatever. You're training strictly mm-hmm. for speed. So I think number one, that that's a big thing that people who want to go down this path need to understand first and foremost. But but one thing that I've heard both of y'all say is um, that it is more important or more beneficial that you either Eddie said to hit balls. Uh, he had a five by five program. So hit five balls, five sets with your two to three minutes rest in between. And and you said to hit, I believe it was either a head cover or a towel. Uh, and, yeah. And, and that... So, um, to, yeah, to cut a long story, long story. So that, that, that almost is a, a massive conversation in itself. So uh, I was the first man in Europe with a set of uh, speed sticks. Mm-hmm. Uh, maybe ten years ago, so people tend to see them as a as a new product. I had them quite a long time ago, 
And uh, even now with uh, other um, equipment coming out, which is based on swinging and hitting fresh air, I think they have a piece in speed training, a small bit, maybe 8%, 10%. Um, if you had a person who never goes down the gym and never, never speed trains, you know, they can get a nice bit of speed from a speed stick. Uh, the, the category of golfer I found out has the least improvement of very good players who, are, who have a tempo, a rhythm that they can't stop. You could speed train them for six months, get them to hit a ball, they just did it at the same speed that they had in the first place. So uh, they also cannot work in other areas. Um, so my, my training uh, tends to be a, a bit of speed stick. If I was doing speed training, I was teaching a bit of speed stick. I don't think it's any harm. Uh, I think if you don't want to buy a set of speed sticks, swing in your own driver with your own shaft and your own head and your own grip on, you get some quite nice results from that. Uh, I'm, a, I'm certainly a big believer in hitting pads uh, and hitting balls. Um, mm -hmm. Hitting pads. Um, and I, I sort of got that. It's one of those things I thought I'd invented and found out uh, uh, someone actually did, did made pads. But, at a golf club, you know when someone brings the buggy back and they leave three head covers in that, mm -hmm. and then the next guy does it, and at the end of the year, you've got 8,000 head covers sitting there. <laughs> so I started experimenting with pads, and my idea came a bit from boxing training where you you have to hit pads to get it. And I was having real success in that the person could hit the pad or the, the head cover. It was very safe. They didn't get injured. They weren't really trying to hit it straight. They were just trying to do it. Their brain and their body were getting ready for impact. Uh, and then the stronger they got, I put one head cover with two and then three and then four. The long drive guys could hit three or four. It wasn't breaking their club. Impact bags I found too heavy. Mm -hmm. And I was doing really well with that. And then um, uh, John Novosel, a guy who um, was a very interesting guy to talk to from Tour Tempo in America, uh, he was making pads to hit for a slightly different reason. But he's a really interesting guy to talk to. So I thought I'd invented something, and he was already doing something similar. Uh, and then I've, I've carried that pad training on. Um, also hitting balls, if the person watching this was to say, what's, what's, what's the quickest way I could gain any speed? Because for a lot of people gaining speed, um, maybe even a, a good player, they don't really want to try and change their technique overly. So if you put them in a net and get them hitting shots at max speed, up the quantity over a few weeks to maybe 30, 40, 50 balls, that will add four or five miles an hour to their swing without really actually interfering with their thoughts on their swing. Uh, ironically, from a reverse engineering point of view, sometimes if you give people speed sticks or get them to hit balls at max speed, their movement actually improves for the better without them working on the movement, interestingly. I've heard uh, that more than once lately. Yeah, so uh, I'm, I'm a big believer. And I'm, I've done it 10, 15 years ago. I give someone some speed sticks. And they went, around, I see you've been, you've been having lessons off someone. Where'd you get a new move from? And they said, no, I've just <laughs> been trying to swing a stick. So I think a part of my, my coaching has got to the fact if you can put them in an the environment of speed, their movements can improve anyway, even without your input on what they're trying to do. Um, I think the other thing as well, if you were, if you had uh, access to radar, now originally very expensive, but if someone at home was wanting to work on speed, there's two inexpensive radars: SSR Swing Speed Radar, Amazon hundred pounds or hundred dollars, or PRGR. PRGR <laughs> is an excellent speed training, very accurate device that measures club headed speed and ball speed, because. In reality, if you want to learn and practice on speed, you need to be measuring. Without that, you're just guessing. Mm -hmm. um, uh, sometimes if you hit a shot, it feels fast. It's not fast and vice versa. You can hit one thing I didn't feel very fast and it was fast. So you need, you need to measure. And these days, um, I, uh, I, t I try and take control of the flight scope. I'll hide the screen. And they'll hide the screen for many reasons is that you can get a bit like an accountant where you get someone looks at all the numbers, yeah? So if it was on a, a on a simulator indoors and we were working on clubhead speed, I would only have clubhead speed. Uh, they'd ask me the other numbers and I wouldn't tell them. And sometimes <laughs> with a long drive guy, if I was looking at the numbers on my screen and it was uh, 151 clubhead speed, they'll say me, what was it? I said 147, uh, just to make them push harder because they <laughs> so I can lie to them, yeah? So uh, I only have one number up. So if I was someone trying to build on clubhead speed, uh, I would maybe do some speed stick work. 
I would get in the net, hit some head covers. The only trouble with those, you've got they're noisy, they fly off. I'd hit mm -hmm. me into a net. I would get a ball in the net. And then I would only have club heads teed up, just focusing on that one number. And you're right, nets, nets and stuff like that take away the worry of the ball. Uh, certainly for very good players, uh, they won't allow themselves to hit many bad shots. They'll shut it down very quickly. And I think the other big point from that, Pete, from uh, this is this is different to long drive. Long drive, you have to learn how to hit the ball 100% of your capacity. Mm -hmm. So when online someone says to me, "Oh, he's not very good. He didn't hit the grip many times." You don't you don't play golf like that. That's not how they play golf. This is long drive. It's a different sport. They only need one ball in. And so they have to learn how to hit the ball at 100%. For the rest of the golf world, practicing at really high speeds brings their max speed up, but it actually brings their playing speed up. So knocking that up brings the playing speed under. And actually, to add speed into your swing isn't about trying to hit the ball really hard. It's changing your swing possibly to mechanical advantage that make it go quicker. But training it and having a speed reserve that's up here so say you're swinging at 100 miles an hour and you learn to swing at 115, 108 feels really easy. And it's not about learning to hit the ball hard if you want to play golf. It's about learning to push the max and then pull the playing speed up with it. Yeah, that, that, that has been a common denominator across the board. And everyone who I've talked to about speed or head on or you listen to, it, it's raising the, the baseline. Yeah. And I think Bryson DeChambeau has uh, talked about that quite a bit uh, for yeah. people who follow the, the the tour or live or you know whatever uh someone wants to call it yeah and we uh, we know we know that bryson for instance um you know he can get 210 215 ball speed at his peak don't ever see him much over 180 190 and they're talking about Ryder cup the last Ryder cup when you thrashed us yeah and he hit that famous shot into the first hole and the commentator said i can't believe how hard he hit it he chipped it on the green yeah he weren't <laughs> even trying you know 189 ball speed i think um I was reading the other day, I've not been Richie Hunt, the statistic statistician was saying that he didn't believe that 189 or 190, much more was that was useful on the golf course, which I thought was quite interesting. So uh, I think Bryson's speed can be 215. He's probably a clever boy. He's probably worked out that 189 is about as much that's worthwhile on the golf course. I heard that as well, that, that once you crest 190, 190, 195 is becoming, uh, you, you lose control of the ball to, yeah, to, too much. I think golf course designs probably don't suit that much either, you know? Mm -hmm. So, you know, a little bit further, it's going a bit further offline potentially. So, uh, you know, I, I have seen that number. I don't know whether there's a scientific study behind that, but that seems to be what the, the statisticians believe would be about the right number and scientifically how much you can control the ball at. How, how much of a role uh, does does time in the gym play in the ability for somebody to swing faster? And the, the, the for quite some time, the common consensus was that there's an internal governor that we all have in, in the brain. And if the body feels like it's going to hurt itself, it's, it's going, that governor is going to kick on, meaning if it doesn't have the strength to hold physical structure, yeah. it, it, it's going to down, it's going to kick down and you're, it won't let you ramp up uh, anymore for, for the sake of the human being. Yeah. Um, what, so th there, there's force production, there's hypertrophy, there's strength training. But what, what role does that play in the ability to increase the swing speed? Uh, massive. So, you know, uh, we can see in the long drive, all those guys are fit and strong. Uh, and if they're not, they won't be able to compete. They won't be robust enough to be able to hit it at that level. Um, mm -hmm. When I was younger, there, there was a couple of guys fit on tour. And now they're all fit and the, the, the speeds are much higher. I know there's an equipment part of that as well. So if you ask me, uh, what part does it play massive? We know that most golfers perform well below their athletic ceiling. Mm -hmm. Most golfers perform. Uh, most golfers, uh, you know, uh, you know, a lot of people, their last bit of fitness they ever do is when they leave school, yeah? So uh, <laughs> um, the, uh, I think also, uh, I think there's also the other big bit to that, but is that uh, so to answer your question, it's 100% important. I actually think there's two governors. The one that your body says don't get injured there's also one in your brain that doesn't like swinging fast because you're worried about where the ball's going. So I think there's two mm -hmm. of them, yeah? Um, I think uh, no doubt that makes a difference. The other thing, though, is in the beginning of class, you know, I had one last week, but this would be like a normal conversation. Guy comes in, and I like to have a bit of fun with him and a bit of chat, but the, the first conversation is the most important one, you know. I said to a guy last week, um, have you, uh, you know, uh, 
I don't think you're fit enough, you know, if you want to do it. Do you want to, do you want to, you know, no, I'm not interested in going to the gym. Now, in actual fact, that was a very good answer to me because I then know that's out the window, yeah? Mm -hmm. And how I look at it, so that, that was a very honest answer. And he told me exactly what he was going to do. And that was great because uh, a lot of people say, I will, and they don't do it, yeah? So I much prefer yeah. that answer. <laughs> So this, this is this is how I would look at it as a, as a, as a sort of global idea or a big idea. So uh, I'm making these numbers up but the, to give you an idea of how my brain works. So say a guy, long drive guy might want to add 25 miles an hour. An average guy might want to add five miles an hour, yeah? Mm -hmm. So he says, okay, I'm going to go to the gym. So, I, okay, uh, I'll put him in touch. I know a lot about it, but I'm not a gym expert. I said, no, so I'm going to give him to my expert, yeah? He comes back, he's going to give him two or three miles an hour, yeah? Mm -hmm. So the next thing, do you do any speed training? Uh, do you know how to periodize your practice on the range for speed? Don't know how to do that. Okay, I'm going to give you a speed training program. Uh, you need to only three times a week. It's not a big commitment, and that's a big thing with speed training. Two to three times a week is enough. You need to let your body recover. You can get some really good stuff done, and that's going to give him another two or three miles an hour. So now he's got five and a half, yeah? Uh, I don't like his takeaway or his setup. His stance is a bit narrow, so I widen his stance. That's worth half a mile an hour, yeah? <laughs> so then I don't like his early part of his takeaway, so I change that. That's going to give me three quarters of a mile an hour, yeah? And this is this is how my this is how I've always done it or learned to do it over the years. Um, for instance, his back swing's a bit short. I think I might lengthen that a bit. That gives me one. Uh, I don't like his... Uh, you can go on, so I'm going to get one... Half from there, he's down the gym. There's two. There's one. There is no 15 mile an hour button <laughs> that doesn't exist. <laughs> you get bits and pieces from all over the place. So, to answer your question, in the big jigsaw, as I see it, of speed, the gym is a massive part. But if the person tells you you're not going to do it, so this, this is my ticket. Are you ever going to go down the gym? No. Would you do some speed training? They might say, oh, Is that a lot of effort? No, not really. Three times a week, the ten minutes. Yeah, I'll do that. I'll do that. Yeah. And then what I make them do though is I've got this chart that I get them to fill in, and I make them I make them send it back to me every three weeks just to make sure they've done it. <laughs> but that normally goes for the first month. So I think I think the interesting it, 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 with every person, it's mm. it's you know what their body's like. What can they do? How much time do they want to put into it? Um. The big thing that I was laughed at a bit many years ago because I said sp uh, speed was a skill that could be learned, yeah? And mm -hmm. it was always the belief it wasn't. You're either born fast or you're born slow. Now, uh, I have some people coming to me occasionally swinging at 96 miles an hour. Can I ever swing at 150? No, not in your wildest dreams. You'll never swing 150. But you might swing it at 104. So what you'll do is that for everybody, you can add something you know, everyone has their own ceiling, whether that's 100, you know, could be ladies or men, sorry, 80, 90, 100, might be 120, 130. It depends how much time they want to put into it, how much effort they want to put into it. But nearly everyone can go faster. Yeah, there's a lot on the table. I think a lot of people are leaving out there. If if they take the time and effort, reach out to somebody like you or or, or John or as I'm learning this, I, I guess I would be the entry level for if someone wants to get started because I, I, I know enough that they won't get hurt, but I don't know, obviously, hmm. at your level. And it's great to pick your brain. Are, are, do, do you see any particular exercises in the gym so long as somebody, obviously, you would want them, when you send them to your expert, you want to hey, make sure that they're not going to hurt themselves if they do these yeah. things. And for anybody out there listening, we're not giving this advice that you jump into the gym and start doing sure. these things. But are there certain exercises that, that you see that, that seem to have the, the biggest impact on, on a person's ability to, to, to transfer that, what they're doing in the gym into, into speed? So, so uh, as I said to you earlier, I'm no gym expert. I know a bit, fair bit about it, but uh, yeah, I'm in no way a trainer. But I am around a lot of the fastest guys who have ever walked the earth, yeah? Mm -hmm. Now, the fastest guys, I, I, I see different fitness, so this is what they tell me, yeah? Um, that a lot of the guys do very golf, looks like golf swingy type of exercise that you see in social media. The guys that I hang around with very, very, very rarely ever get away from the basics of weightlifting. Pushing, pulling, squatting, lifting. Mm -hmm. And they all tell me it doesn't have to look like a golf swing, doesn't have to be golf specific. And all the fast guys I've seen 
uh, ten, the really, really fast guys tend to not ever get away from the basics of weight training. Yeah, that seems to be a common denominator. I, I think t TPI had posted about three or four weeks ago, Justin James was able to deadlift or I, I can't remember what a de deadlift or squat something like two to th his forces were two to three times the what the normal person would be simply because he could do dead. I think it was deadlift more than twice his body weight or whatever the criteria is for deadlifting. It was off yeah. the charts. And as you mentioned, his verticals are, are the highest ever measured. And that would yeah. make sense yeah. that he's got that ability. Exactly that. So from again, you know, I can't say a certain exercises because it's not my expertise, but the guys who I've hung around with for 25 years, never uh, get too far away from the basis of weight training and being strong. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, uh, many fitness people say that grip strength has a big bearing on it as well, where ladies' grip strength can be a bit weaker. Uh, the guys will tell me if you lift enough weights, the grip strength comes for free anyway, yeah? Yeah. So, yeah. Um, uh, again, not not exactly my expertise, but that's what those guys that never tend to get away from, just the basics of, of good uh, strength and condition and weight training. And, yeah, uh, you, you're not going to pull 400-plus pounds off the ground if you have a weak grip. No, no, exactly. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> And uh, uh, Jason Zubak, uh, the long drive king, I have, a, I have a, a lot of respect for from a weight training perspective. I know he's of that same agreement. And a, and a really interesting, if you've never had him on, a really interesting guy to talk from a, a fitness and a power perspective. A, a great guy. Yes, he's on the short list. To, I've got to reach out to him. I, I, I have this list and I reach out to three or four and then I, I try to schedule them and I, I forget about the others. And, but yeah, J Jason, obviously, cause he, he was in, in my, you know, when I started watching long drive, I think I was in college or just out and, and I'll never forget when he won on his last ball and he hit it off the grid. I mean, yeah, he hit yeah. it so far. Yeah. As soon as he hit it, he knew he, he went, yeah. he went cra crazy. And that He's was jumping, awesome. Jumping around like a lunatic. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> um, as far as when somebody does, you had mentioned some of the ways to get started, you know, you could, get the stick to get going. Um, you could hit balls into a net. You could hit the, 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 the pads or the head covers. It, it, understanding is, as I'm sure you have enough understanding of muscle type and, you know, one is type one is, if I'm not mistaken, is endurance type two. Yeah. A is, is, is speed that you have to train as you get older, like you and I are, we're follically yeah. challenged and, you know, we don't swing yeah. as fast as we used to, yeah. uh, but you have to train that or you lose it. Yeah. Uh, you know, before, and then you lose strength, I believe it's last, but you lose speed first. And then, you know, then you have to, to be, which is your glycogen depletion. Understanding that is there a certain amount of time that, that somebody, because golfers are notorious for hit and drag, hit and drag, hit and drag. And if they go out there and they're going to hit 25 to 50 balls at max speed, they're, they're never going to get to 25. They're going to gas out before. Yeah. And then they're going to say, well, that's bullshit. What John says yeah. doesn't work. Is there a certain protocol that a, a, maybe an entry level or generic that somebody should follow if yeah. they're listening to this and they're going to go out this afternoon or tomorrow and, and try to to get started. So it, if there was a, if there was a quick baseline, if someone was coming in and they wanted to do uh, uh, to get faster, there's certain things I want to check. Uh, I want to check their normal swing and I want them to hit it as fast as they can. Yeah. Uh, mm -hmm. Some people just chip their driver down there and they don't hit it as fast as they can. So I want to see is there a fast man living in and they don't use. I want to see their left arm swing and their right arm swing using a light speed stick. Uh, if one of the arms is uh, slower than the other, I want them to make it faster. I want both arms faster and about the same speed. Um, uh, one thing I found out a long time ago, uh, which made no sense to me from uh, a speed training perspective, in speed training, less is more. So uh, I then read uh, that uh, Zubak's hitting 300 balls a day. Uh, Sean Fist, the Joe Miller could hit 300 balls a day. So I'm thinking, well, that doesn't, make, that doesn't make any sense. So that's completely against the idea of speed training. And then uh, for 20 years, I've, con I've continually done this cycle. You get someone to hit max balls and you build up the quantity of how many mm -hmm. balls they're hitting. Now, when someone sees the 300 balls, they'll try that first day and you'll kill yourself. So if someone is not fitting down the gym, they might be they might be going after 15 balls. So what you do is you turn your radar on. You need a radar if you're going to be serious. You start measuring your max swings. And say you go for the first few swings, you go 100, 100, 100, 101, 99, because speeds generally stay the same. Say you get to ball 16, 17, you start going 98, 97, 96. You shut it down, don't hit another ball, go and practice your putting and go and do something else. Because you're, you're, you're actually going to hurt yourself 
you're, you're you're not going to do any good. You're going to gas yourself out. Yeah, your body's done. Your muscles gonna, are, and your neurological system are shot. Exactly. And the other thing, when people start trying to do speed training, you know, they don't do twice a week or three times a week. They let their body recover. They do 14 days on the trot. And they <laughs> try to, they don't, but that's just that's just human nature to try and do it. So you want to be very um, disciplined in what you do. Next time you do, you might get up the ball 25. Then mm-hmm. after a while, you get up to 30. Then after a while, you get up to ball 40. As soon as you see the speed shut down, turn it off, go and do something else. Then you get up to ball 50. And Bryson went through this exact thing a couple of years ago. Uh, uh, weirdly, with long drive guys, they get to about ball 50 to ball 70 before they start getting really fast. I asked the scientists what they thought once was the idea behind this. Which was, this was their view on it, was that in the building up of fast twitch muscles, if you get a load of quantity of shots, you'll build up those muscles. After a while, because they fatigue quicker, you can then do a smaller quantity when you've got to a really high speed. So that was their, that was their view on how they'd do it. But um, there is merit in, in hitting balls at max speed. But as you said, you don't want to do it to the fact you then deplete all your energy. And don't it, become, it, and don't, it, don't it, become, that was a big mistake. Is there a certain time frame in, in understanding? Because the neurological system plays such an important role. It's just, a, just not the muscular system in the firing. That you're, you're building your neurological system to fire at a faster rate yeah. than, than it's used to doing. And, and that needs recovery as well. So I, I, many years ago, I, I did a lot of reading. as I was Because I was, I was, when I was a kid, I was, I think when I was in high school, when I was a 15 or 16, I was about 6'3", but I was 170 pounds. So I was like a pole. Yeah, and I could never, and until I got out of in the out of college, actually, I could never put on any mass. Mm. So I was always thin through college, even. So yep. naturally, I, I when I was able to, I was I was all in on on weight training and things like probably too much, uh, that may, might have been detrimental to golf at least at that time. But uh, I I do remember from the weight training is is that when you're doing uh, three three reps and, and you increase the number of sets, but you have a longer period of rest in between as opposed if you're doing 10 to 12 repetitions because your neurological system needs to to reset itself more so than the muscular endurance needs to so is that similar when when somebody's going to go out and hit their 25 balls is there a certain amount of time they should rest in between no i I tend to rapid fire them um i don't um I don't have any scientific basis behind that, apart from I found out that it sort of works, yeah? So I'll get them to just keep pulling away. I thought it was interesting that uh, when I saw Bryson doing it, his caddy kept throwing him the ball. Do you remember that? Mm-hmm. Threw it, caught it, teed it up, hit it. Threw it, caught it, teed it up, hit it. And when I saw him do that, that's how I've always done it. I didn't huh. have a bonus. I would machine gun them. And I thought it was interesting when I saw Bryson catching, teeing up, going, catching, teeing up. The long drive guys and the guys that work with tend to hit them pretty fast. I don't have um, five sets of five. They just keep going. Um, hmm. I don't actually know the answer why that works. That would be just my experience of doing it. So that's how I would have done it. And then, as I said, I was interested to see Bryson do that. And I've had all my long drive guys do that. And I've had, sorry, all my amateurs do that. It's just that they can't machine gun it for very long. <laughs> So it, just so anyone listening can make, make it simple. So the, the, the idea is if you're going to go do that, you have to have a speed device, any type of speed device. And, and as you mentioned, the SSR, PRGR, and I'll put links to those. Uh, otherwise, it's a waste of time. You, um, yes. You learn nothing. You can't, you can't feel speed. Mm-mm. And I can attest that. I, I don't, I, I've gotten back into it from years off. I can't tell the difference between 110 and 113. No. Um, and, I, I, in fact, I thought one was slower, and I look, and it's one thirteen. Like that doesn't. How the hell did that happen? Uh, the, uh, and the other thing is, is that, that a golfer will always confuse uh, ball speed with clubbing speed. So they hit a really good shot, and they go, "That's fast." I said, I said, "It might not be. You just hit a good shot." They confuse mm-hmm. the quality of the shot, uh, and then, for instance, and this is why you need a radar. I say you thin it, and they'll go, "I hate that. I didn't like that." No, that's your fastest one so far. Yeah. <laughs> so and then, oh, okay, I didn't like that. But because then, if you just go off the feeling of the shot, you're going down the wrong pathway. Again, yeah, you're drifting back to their comfort level of not training for speed, training for technique. Exactly, exactly. And and then on on that, how I would do it originally, if someone was going on speed, you know, winter's a good time to do it. Probably not in the middle of the season. If you're a tour player, winter's good to do it. And then you've got the next challenge. You're trying to keep that going through the summer when you're touring, yeah. Mm-hmm. Um, Winter's a good time of working at it, probably when you're not too worried about ball flight. Once you've got the speed up, 
then you convert that to ball speed. And once your ball speed good, then you go back to hitting good flights. I've always done it in that order. Club speed first, ball speed second, then get back to hitting a workable shot. In, in Makes the magic recipe that we said earlier that people have, whatever yours is. Being over in the UK, and I, I know he's, uh, there's a difference between Britain and, and Ireland, of course. I, I know enough geography about yeah. that. But um, the, the work Patty Harrington has done has been yeah. very, very impressive. Have, have you played a role in that at all, or has that been no. mostly his work with Jacobs? Yeah, no, I think, from what from what I gather, um, uh, he's always been a tinkerer. I don't I don't know Paddy. I, from guys tell me he's a great bloke. Um, he does work with Michael Jacobs. None of that none of that was to do with me. I did some stuff with Molinari and Dennis Pugh when he had mm -hmm. his few years ago, but not Paddy. Um, uh, what I was impressed with with Harrington uh, in uh, in lockdown. Uh, he did a video from his house with his dog every day. Did you see that? Yeah, yeah. And that, that was, some, that's pretty cool. Some, some backyard there, yeah? <laughs> yeah, not too bad. <laughs> and he did he did a video on uh, speed training. So I turned it on, and with actually uh, no thought that it would be any good. And then I listened to what he said. He was very educated on that subject. He was hmm. exceptionally educated, not through me. But he'd obviously done his homework and he'd worked very diligently and he'd done a lot of speed training work. And obviously he'd done some work with Michael Jacobs uh, subsequently on his swing and other factors. But uh, his degree of knowledge on the subject was exceptional. And uh, I've watched lots of uh, videos that tour players do and I've listened to them thought they don't know anything about that. <laughs> and sometimes that's not a bad way to be, yeah? Exactly, because you're th those guys are point and shoot. There's no no. Well, but, Bryson might be calculating a bunch of things, but most of those guys are. I want to hit it there, and I'm going to do it. Here's how I'm going to do it. And uh, he his knowledge on that subject was exceptional and uh, very clever. Um, uh, if any of you ever get a chance to listen to Martin Borgmar, you've seen Martin Borg Borgmar. Uh, a lot of people when they see long drive guys tend to think they're big, uh, you know, big idiot meatheads. Yeah, mm -hmm. he's a seriously intelligent guy. And uh, very much worth listening to if, if you hear him talk about speed training as well. But Harrington, I was very impressed with uh, both how he planned his work and the depth of knowledge on the subject, which was uh, excellent. Yeah, it, it, in today's world, with the access to knowledge that, that we have through the Internet and, and everywhere else, to, to become world class at something and, and to reach the highest level that those fellows have, you, you cannot be just flat out ignorant. There's, there's too much known out there. There's too many people like yourself who, who can coach these uh, athletes to to get to the level that they want to, and mm. you, you're not just going to get there uh, like you might have maybe when we were younger, j just off sheer physical ability and, and sure. saying I want to do this. You know that, that, that it's it's not possible anymore. I, I remember somebody asked Boo Weekly because uh, Boo and I played a lot together on the smaller tours many years ago. It's hard to believe it's 20 years ago now. Mm. Um, but I remember someone after a couple years after Boo had gotten his car, and I think after he won his first event here and. Uh, Harbor Town. They said, "Could somebody come up like you did, where they didn't play in college and and they just ground their way through the mini tours and the ranks and came up?" And he said, "No, I don't think you can. There, there's too much information. There's too many good coaches, and there's yeah. there's too much data now that you, you you're fight. It's hard enough to get there, and when you're fighting somebody who's got all this information that's helping them, and you're trying to figure it out yourself, it's it's not possible. And I think that's what I fell into. I was either the reluctant, didn't have the capital to." to go out and search out some people it was all friends and hey can you take a look and okay tweak this and yeah it was it was too i i, I was putting myself behind the eight ball too much and, and looking back i mean that was mm. 15 years ago 20 years ago yeah yeah and there, 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 there's plenty of information out there um uh, you know I, I should, maybe i shouldn't say this really but a lot of the guys you need to talk to aren't, aren't on tour if, if you yeah know, exactly if you know what i mean uh you know michael jacobs probably isn't on tour Mm -mm. Uh, as in he wouldn't be at the tour event every week. So um, I think a lot of tour guys will just go with the people who are there at the range. Mm -hmm. could... Yeah, that that dynamic has changed since the Ledbetter era. Where I think Ledbetter was the first one to go out there, and he was definitely the first one to go out there and take a camera. And then through the 90s, late 80s and 90s and 2000s, it became – you know, get, get the coaches out there and help you. And yeah. nowadays, it's, there's so much information out there. And whether it's right or wrong, players on, on tours, the men, the women, live PGA, DP, whatever it is. Um, they coaches tell me friends who are, have done that. And they say that the, the, 
the loyalty just doesn't quite seem to be there. If something goes wrong, it's like they want to jump ship right away and go to somebody else. Oh, for sure. Which, which is not a good thing. As you mentioned, you, you don't get to the tour and say, well, let me change this. Yeah. It's, it's hard enough. Keep doing and, what you're doing. And that, 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 that is the, the tour coach has probably got the least job security of any job. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And, and no one that I know, but maybe it's just because the age now, uh, that no one wants to travel three three weeks you know you have kids and you have family and yeah. it's nice to sleep in your own bed and most coaches played at some point like, i don't want to go back to that bullshit no wait waking up look at the ceiling and it's like where am i no that's uh, <laughs> there's no fun in that that is for sure what um you know i i over you know, i've had obviously i've had sasha on a couple of times i had lunch with him and talked to him about another number of different things and and other coaches and players and i i have written down a number of things that as I've learned and tried to help some students with increasing swing speed that uh, some of them in, that I'll just touch on it. And then you pick which ones you want to talk about. Um, obviously one that we talked about, you train for speed only. If you're going to train for speed, go train for speed. Don't, you don't give two shits about the direction the ball went. In. No. Um, the hand path increase, which we touched on. Yeah. Uh, forces on the handle. And I know Sasha was the first one I heard brought this to light was starting. And, and you mentioned it, uh, already, but uh, how somebody takes a club away. So everyone used to take it low and slow and all that yep. you know, jazz. But he said it, and you said it that the way you take it away and the forces on applied to the to the shaft, that taking it away, is, uh, ripping the grip off the club handle off the shaft from the takeaway is much more productive for force production, and especially as it changes direction because it's going one way and you have to change it. I guess if I was going to ask you to to talk on one, that that would be it. Can you? Maybe expand yeah. on that a bit. So, uh, yeah, and and we know there's outliers. So anyone watching this, you know, there's, there's people who don't do that. Yeah, uh, yeah, who know that. And there's there's people who pause at the top. Matsuyama, uh, Cam Cam Young. Cam Young's got a little pause at the top, hasn't he? Mm -hmm. And uh, him goes away slow. But in the main, generally, faster backswings mean faster downswings. From a, a muscle activity change of direction, swinging it fast back, swinging it fast down. Um, getting speed out to the club head. Um, uh, it's interesting, PRGR, uh, which I said uh, can actually measure your backswing. I, I found that by accident. I made a few backswings at the top to do that. <laughs> so you can actually measure that if it's too slow. I think also um, the, the much work's been done on tempos and how long um, uh, it takes to make a swing. We know it's about a second. Uh, a lot of amateurs take much longer to make that swing. So uh, just getting from A to B in a shorter time would also make it faster, which therefore puts force on the club. So in the main, there are outliers. Faster backswings generally make faster downswings. Um, and, and, and is that because the force is put onto the shaft or just, yeah, the, the, just a reaction yeah. to it? And then muscle activation as you change direction, try and slow the club down and move it the other way. I think you get nice stretches across the different parts of your body. Uh, and, uh, you know, just getting speed out to the club quickly. As I said, it, you can actually measure it on the PRGR. So um, generally, moving that club fast back generally means it will move fast down. And, you know, the, if you take Sasho's work on, from my understanding of it, in linear and angular, that, you you know, we want the hands working fast in certain areas of the swing very early in the downswing. We know that slows down. Um, we know that the linear work dies off a bit and is replaced by angular. So it's having a bit of a knowledge as well on which parts to get the club working in a certain way would help. It's very interesting. Um, you know, one thing that one of the guys that was, uh, he, he was kind of, I guess he was a coach of mine, a mentor, whatever you want to call it. He, he, and he, he was I, at one time, this is going back about 12, 15 years ago, maybe he was in the seniors or no, he's in the super seniors at the long drive at the world's. <laughs> And it was the last year that Sedlowski won. Yeah. And, you know, everyone was amazed at how far he could hit it with his physical build. Yeah. But my buddy was in the super seniors and it, uh, I'm not sure his height, about five, nine, 165 pounds. He hit one 378. So yeah. pound for pound, he had beat Sedlowski by a 10th of, a, of yeah. a point. Uh, but he had always told me as we would just talk about swing in general, cause he was without a formal education in physics and, and, he was a shaft expert. He still consults with many shaft companies around the world. Yeah. Um, that by the time after the, the lead arm passes parallel to the ground in a downswing, 
that it's actually starting to slow down, which you tell that to most people and they're that you're full of shit. Like, well, yeah. it is, but the, the club is generating the force or the speed at that point. It's about P, if you do the P position, about P4, mm -hmm. P5, about P5.5, just below left arm horizontal. And hands normally slow down by about 25%. Mm -hmm. And it, it's just pure physics, isn't it? Yeah. Uh, yeah, just as the hands change direction, the club gets thrown outwards. The club goes that way, it slows down the motion. And uh, what, what's interesting, though, from uh, I spoke about earlier how, um, you know, you could swing an iron fast and a wood slow, what would happen is that having hands that go through the shot quite fast is actually quite good for irons, but pretty poor for wood. So, and why is that? Uh, so, so as you're moving an iron coming in, you know, hands going quickly forward, but you actually want to slow that down much more and change the shape of your wood swing. So... With, uh, with your hands, it changes a little bit. So what's good for uh, iron sometimes isn't good for woods. And, and is that uh, where the, the, the lead side starts working upwards and backwards, that, that the hands basically become like a vice onto the club and it, it allows that club head to, to, yeah. to come in even faster? So exactly that. So as, as the force on the, the, the handle changes direction and eventually starts to work inwards and upwards, that mm -hmm. has pulling force, so a force that throws the club out to catch up with the hands. So that's a big part of generating speed at the bottom there. Very, very interesting. It, um, I mean, we, we can talk about this for hours, on the, on the, <laughs> yeah. and I'm sure you have. <laughs> what um, do, do do you think at some point that as the guys are mostly the guys, and the women are very good too. Trey Mullins is one that comes to mind, and she hits the ball a mile. For, yeah. Um, it's very impressive. Uh, so l let's say long drivers in general, and even on the PGA Tour, the DP Tour, Live Tour, pick, pick, a, pick your favorite tour. Is there some point that the body is not going to be capable of holding the, the, the forces that it's, are being applied to it? We're, we're, we're going to start to see the athletes uh, become more injured because they, the soft tissue, the, the bone structure, the muscular system, and, and the nervous system can't handle the amount of forces being produced. It, um. Uh, again, maybe not quite my expertise. Uh, if I've been around long drive people for many, many years, from what I've seen, the ones I work with, I, I can't talk for other people, don't get injured that much. Uh, they train very hard. They make their body very robust. I, I can't say I've never seen them injured, but they, 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 a lot of people say to me they must be injured. All the time. I don't see or haven't seen that many injuries. I think, uh, obviously, if you're going to swing it exceptionally fast, you probably have needed to work on your body to get to that speed anyway, yeah? Mm -hmm. So I think people swinging it at really fast speeds will generally have done some work on their body to tolerate that and make it robust enough for those forces. I don't really see that as an injury thing. Uh, you know, there probably has been plenty of long drive people who have got themselves injured. Just in my in my experience of the, I don't know, few hundred I work with, is something I haven't seen a huge amount of. It, it, when, when you're working with some, some of these players who are swinging at those speeds, do, do you have them take time away from it to allow their body to kind of to have a break and, and recover and just uh, allow it to, to get back to a, yeah, a normal, if there is such a word, state? Yeah. Um, so let, uh, just a, for, uh, an example, for instance, would be Joe Miller um, taking a long drive. But and again, you could look at this from a tour player or, or an amateur. So, uh, world uh, World Championships is next week. World Long Drive is next week. Mm -hmm. um, so um, Joe's not competing this year, but say he was. So he would have worked up to this point. Uh, they'll be trying to peak for next week. Uh, this uh, That event's a little different, and it goes four days in a row as opposed to one-day event. So the preparation will be different to be able to try and last for the four days. Uh, Joe used to finish the World Championships, get home, put his clubs in the shed, go and do some bodybuilding, and turn up about four months later. And I thought it was quite good. He lost a lot of his speed in that time. It, it'd go from uh, 153 to 154 to 140, and it would take him about uh, five weeks to get back up to 155 again. Mm -hmm. So um, I think uh, I think resting is good. I think it's a good thing to do in the winter, but you, you'll just return quite often back to a lower speed that you then can build back up again. So... Yeah. Um, some people have come back. If they've changed their swings, they come back quite fast. But if the people were just speed training to keep a level, when they shut it down, they'll quite often come back to a, a to a lower speed. They have to build up again. And I said earlier, tour players have the, have the challenge um, of uh, getting fast in the winter. 
and then trying to keep that in competition season when they're travelling, playing four days a week, it's not easy. They're not trying to go faster. They're just trying to keep that the same mm-hmm. without it dropping down again. So I think shutting down for the winter is good. Uh, it, um, it will probably mean you'll lose a bit, a little bit of your speed and you can get back up again. Um, looking now at long drive, I'd probably, and I'd probably just get it ticking over to try and to go from that slow speed back up again was probably too big a journey. So I think you just make it tick over. But I don't, resting, I think, is a vital part of the speed jigsaw. I, I remember as I got into training and working with trainers who were really exceptional at, at, at what they did. That uh, let's say if I, you know, you get around the holiday, you know, Christmas, New Year's, and you, you really don't feel like training. Nobody's doing anything. You're eating yep. too much, drinking too much, and staying up too late. Uh, and it, but then after the New Year, you know, I get back in the gym and and I have trouble. I, I tell them, man, I really, you know, I lost fifteen percent of what I was doing yeah. three three four weeks ago. And they said yeah. it, it at that point, but when when I was training quite a bit, you know three, four days a week. And they said it, it's more neurological at that point and give it about three, three uh, sessions in the gym and, and you'll be right back where you were. Right. Now, that was, what I was doing all the time. So I'd imagine those, those uh, athletes that you're working with when it does come back, it's just, it's more the neurological sequencing than it is anything else it, it, exactly. that, that they get it back. Exactly. And it comes back. It doesn't take very long. It comes back because, um, uh, cause they, they knew how to do it in the first place, if you know what I mean. Mm-hmm. It's like so, riding a bike. Yeah, uh, but they'll quite often panic that they can't remember how to do it, but it does come back in the end. Um, Father time will catch up with them in the in the end eventually. <laughs> but while they're fit and strong, it comes back. That's very true. What do you see? It's usually that the next big thing often comes from the periphery because those who are in the middle of it often are, work, are so focused on working on, on the things that we know yeah. uh, to improve upon those things. But is, is there anything that you see uh, because you seem to have a knack for whether you have the science behind it or not, you seem to have a knack for instinctively identifying things that are going to be improvements, whether in someone's golf swing or in this case, in, in increasing speed and long drive. And and the periphery seems to be where people who have the time and effort to put into researching things or coming up with different ideas and trial and error. Is there anything that you see that, that would be the next uh, movement in, in, in swing speed and, and long drive? Uh, after the big build-up, I don't know of anything yet. <laughs> so <laughs> um, there's, no, there's nothing. Uh, uh, every year, um, so as I said, from an education point of view, always try and learn a new subject. And this is from my own point of view. So I tried to study a lot of Sasha McKenzie's stuff. I looked at a lot of Michael Jacobs' stuff. Uh, I made myself very knowledgeable on force plates. Uh, I'm trying to make myself more knowledgeable in kinetics and in, in, in how the, the, the forces and torques apply to the club. Um, me and Steve Furlonger are uh, going to be using the Fenris marker list system and we're collecting a big database uh, on the fastest in the world. Whether that will throw up anything or, as we said earlier, is, just, is it just the individual who does that? So I'm trying to fill in the bits I don't know. Um, and whether there's something new coming out that I don't know, I might phone you in a couple of weeks and said, there's this really interesting thing. A, 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 a guy in Germany told me this. Um, there was a, so sorry, now I'm talking. I'm speaking to this guy in Germany. And there's this new technology he told me not to tell anyone about, that I'm telling you about, but I'm not going to tell you the name of it. That could, okay. tell, that could tell you, I can't actually, I'll have to look it up, yeah that could tell you the force output from each muscle in the body during the golf swing. So there is something, uh, albeit he's going to tell me more about it when I see him next time. So uh, that there is something that I would be very interested that no one else is looking at from uh, not, not the alpha man, uh, Michael Jacobs thing. This is actually measuring the muscle itself as opposed to doing the calculations on it. Wow. So, so that would be very interesting to me. And I've got to get back to the guy and see how that progress is going. But what I do every year is I try and just edu- educate myself on a new subject. So, uh, markerless systems, 3D tracking, I'm looking at. I'm interested in this. Moment. So, I'm looking. And if I don't know it as yet, I'm certain I'll keep looking for it, yeah? Yeah. What, what, is there anything that you have your eye on for 24 that you're going to be looking more into or, uh, or want to learn more about? I'm going to spend more time with my colleague, Steve. Uh, force plate wise and uh, 3D data collection wise, uh, speed wise, and putting those together, uh, they are going to be able 
uh, in Fenris uh, to be able to calculate the forces and torques on the handle. So then we're collecting data from the fastest. So that's my that's my project for this coming year. Yeah, that that is pretty deep for someone who says they're not very good with tech. No, uh, all, that, all, that, I that, do, that, that, that. all I do is that they'll send me the eight-page report, and I just turn to the summary. Yeah. Yeah, well, I, I, want, I don't want to keep it too long. You've been very grateful with with your time. Uh, one thing I got to ask you on is these these fellas and, and these ladies who who you work with, because they're they're doing things that the average human just looks at. And there's no way they can do it. As you mentioned, you can't. You're not going to take somebody from 96 to 150. Yeah. But the the ability to recover is, is more is talked about recovery in today's world. Do do you see any of them utilizing ice baths or you know the percussion where they you know it's got like a, a pounding on the muscle or that's a terrible way to explain it um, the massage gun things yeah the massage gun so you got ice baths massage guns saunas uh th things like that to reduce the inflammation as far as the, the ice baths I, could. And I only bring that up because i've been doing that for a number of years and i found great results from it i had dr tom seeger on who's a he's devoted himself now he's resigned from uh, morosco forge uh yep. to total research on on ice benefits of uh, cold therapy um, yeah. But is it? Do you see uh, the fellas or the girls doing any of that stuff? Yeah. So um, I think the, f the 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 first bit on that, the 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 bit when they're swinging those bits, it, in the world of long drive or life, there's freaks out there. So as as long as you ever want to swing at one fifty, there's people that are just freaks of nature. Mm -hmm. So uh, you know, Martin Borgmeier turns up to me swinging it pretty terrible with no long drive technique at one forty four. Yeah. So. Um, <laughs> <laughs> the, the people, people like that are just freaks as a start point. So I think, uh, you know, whatever training or therapy or recovery you do, some people are just born as freaks. They'll be able to, men or ladies. Mm -hmm. Now, as far as the recovery, um, again, being around those guys, an awful lot of them have ice baths. Not me. I'd never get in one of those. In I was going to ask you, have you jumped in one yet? Nah. I, I, I need a swimming pool, like, like a bath to even think about getting in it. Uh, uh, massage guns. Most of them had uh, most of them had massages uh, and work on mobility uh, and get their joints moving nicely and have lots of ice baths. So uh, from the guys who are doing what the, 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 you asked me about, they're all doing what you're saying. Interesting. Yeah, I I, I found the again I found the benefit of that many years ago mm. and uh, having Doc Tom Doc Seeger. Um, yeah. uh, and, and following his work, it, it's been very, very interesting that, hmm. that, that I think they're finding out a lot more things outside of just reduction of inflammation and recovery. Um, sure. I'm a big Andrew Huberman fan, as I'm sure many around the world are. I don't know if you've seen him at all. No, I don't know. He, he's a, a, a neuroscientist and ophthalmologist from uh, Stanford, and he's got a podcast. It's all science-based, the uh, Huberman hmm. Lab podcast. But he had on another professor from uh, Stanford that uh, he had developed a, a, a device that the, the special forces uh, are using that it, it he, they found out that f when you overheat, for example, so this goes to, and I, I bring this up because this goes into training that you might find useful. Yeah. And I'll, I'll send you the link to it. Sure. Um, that the way to cool the body down fastest is there are certain areas of the body that you would put uh, a cold towel or, you know, so, something that's, it's not going to be freezing. It's just got to be cold. Yeah. And it's the bottom, the bottom of the feet, the, the palms of the hands and the face and the face on men where there wouldn't be a hair follicle. Mm. So it, it, and he, the, the gentleman relates it to the equivalent of running water through a radiator and it cools the engine. So you wouldn't just pour cold water into an engine to cool it. You would run it through. So it would cool gradually. And then, and then, so, and, and the importance of that, if I understood it correctly, was the, as somebody trained, so let's take long driving and you're going after balls and you're, as we said you're gonna the caddy's gonna throw them you're gonna hit it and you're gonna machine gun them as, until your body can't mm. do it anymore but what happens when the body the muscle starts to to slow down when people see that that drop is because the muscle is starting to get heated and it, it's sending a message to the brain it's like we, we need to stop or we're gonna overheat mm. but if, if if you take some time in between your reps or your sets or whatever you're doing and you're able to cool either your hands and and the special forces i think have a it, it's a mitten uh, like a catcher's mitt that they can put on their hands and it, it circulates water through there and it, it cools the body down faster because special forces, you know, they're dealing with life and death situations, not sure. whether they hit the grid or not. And, and uh, they're, they're dealing in some of the most extreme mm. places in the world. 
Um, so they have to be able to do that. It's a life-saving thing. But as far yep. as a long driver or a trainer uh, in, in the gym at Stanford, I think they put a number of the athletes through it. And they, they were seeing increases, if I'm not mistaken, in the 30 to 40 percent range for some yep. of their athletes. Uh, that's fascinating. There, there's my new there's my new entry level of what I want to learn about. Yeah, <laughs> it could be, it could be your, for 24. But yeah, I, I will send you that that link to that show and any information I, I can get on that. I'll, I'll try to get you an email and you you can I'll let you do the, the digger deep. Yeah. deeper I, digging and i'll follow up with you on how it's working appreciate that Peter. yeah thanks mate. awesome uh do you have a few minutes that we could wrap up with some emergency cool. nine questions just some fun cool. stuff that i throw out there to you and you just yeah. whatever comes to mind yep so with, with the Ryder cup just ending let, let's say that your professional playing career had, had gone a different direction and, and you had made the Ryder cup and you're yeah. going to walk up to the first hole and they're going to crank the music uh get get everybody fired up what what, what song are you going to have them play cool. Uh, Hendrix, Voodoo Child. <laughs> Spoken like someone from the UK, definitely. <laughs> um, your favorite purchase under five hundred dollars in the last three years? Could spin be anything. Bike. Spin bike. Is that right? Yeah, I, I I used to be a jogger, but my knees have gone. Mm -hmm. So uh, I love I love keeping fit, but I just can't run anymore. So I thought I'd given up running, but the spin bike means I can still get a a sweat going, and uh, uh, I don't enjoy it as much as running, but it's kept me fit. Keep you after it a little bit. Yeah, exactly. Um, there's a Hollywood comes to you, and they say, we, we want to do a movie about you, and, and you get to pick who plays the lead role. Who are you going to pick? Jeez, that's difficult. Yeah. Yeah, that's a tricky one. Who played me? It could be a handsome leading man, so that takes a few of them out. <laughs> Tom, Tom Hanks, he can do anything, Yeah. <laughs> May, may, uh, we keep it for uh, UK. For, maybe we'd get Tom Hardy to play you. Yeah, yeah exactly. Yeah. <laughs> um, what, what, if you had a superpower, what would it be? Oh. What do your friends tell you your superpower is? Uh, what is my superpower? I'm very observant. On That's most... a good one. Even yeah, uh... based off what I've read on you and then you explaining, you know, you, you, you seek out the, the most informative people you can and learn from them. That, that's yeah. a very rare trait. Everyone yeah. nowadays wants to tell you how smart they are. Yeah, yeah. I, I know I only know a little bit. I said earlier, I just know people who are clever, yeah? <laughs> that, that, that's, that is a superpower, and more yeah. people should try to develop that skill. Yeah. Uh, the most used app on your phone? Uh, well, uh, most used app. So here you go, it's easy for me. My video analysis one, because um, I told you I wasn't technical. If I've got 20 apps, I only use one of them. Uh, and, I look at, <laughs> and I live in England, so I look at the weather app every day as well. Oh, that one should be easy. It's going to be yeah. partly rainy and, and a little overcast. Yeah, that's exactly right. <laughs> a bit of wind, yeah. If, if, they, if the powers of golf came to you and said, Lee, we want to change one rule in golf, what, what rule would you tell them to change? Yeah, I don't think I would have to. I have a divot. I can't, I can't have, yeah, I, I, yeah. What's I don't hit a great shot down the fairway. What's the point of that? I remember Duval, Duval a few years ago, last hole of the Masters, had a chance of winning in a divot. I, I'll tell you a real quick funny story. Not wasn't funny at the time. Uh, I had the U.S. Open qualifier. I don't remember is the section or the regional one year. Hmm. And the the first five holes, uh, the six holes of par three. So the first five holes, I hit it down the middle of the fairways in a divot and everywhere. Yeah. And my brother looked at me, he was caddying for me, and said, who the hell did you piss off this morning? <laughs> yeah, great. Um, for someone who's who's been around golf as long as you have, and I'm sure you've been many places, yeah. what would be your favorite golf course? More. Uh, Royal County down in Northern Ireland is pretty difficult to beat. Uh, it comes top three in the world um, generally, but that's tough to beat. Uh, the one great thing we have in the UK is that unlike the States, you can play any of the great courses tomorrow. Yeah, that is awesome. Yeah, anything. There's no, uh, I don't think I can think of, I can think of a couple of private, but of the great courses, I can't think of one you can't just pay a green fee and go. Yeah, it, it's, I told my uh, girlfriend uh, yesterday, I said, I, I'm going in the next year while I can still play golf at a decent mm -hmm. level and I'm trying to get some speed back, I, I said, yeah. I'm going to go to the UK in the next year to two because that, that is a bucket list for me and play yeah. golf. And you could go uh, Britain, Britain, England, Scotland, Ireland, Wales. You can tick off 25 of the 30 of the best courses in the world, and you phone them up, you're on. So and I, I, I'm, I'm gonna, I'll call you and, or reach out to you and come see yeah. you, and you, you're probably going to say, yeah, it, it's too late. 
you, you, I, there's nothing I can do for you. Uh, you're going to swing at 112. Uh, the rest, you'll be lucky to stay there the rest of your life. So I can't help you. You're, you're not getting a 120. Uh, Just uh, pack it in. Let's go have a beer. Uh, t- two more, if you don't mind. Yeah, no if, if you could, if you could sit in a golf cart and talk to anybody in, in uh, throughout history, anybody you want to for yeah. for 15 or 30 minutes, six, however long, long you want to talk, who who would it be? Uh, Genghis Khan. Hmm. And uh, Winston Churchill. I have not heard those two yet, but very interesting people. Uh, and the last one. So the first and the one, the last one everybody gets, every, the ones in between are always changing. But in your opinion, uh, as far as golfing players uh, that played at the highest level, who, who's the GOAT? Who's the greatest of all time? Uh, Nicholas. It seems to be a generational answer. Yeah. So if, if you're if you're older than forty five, almost everyone has said Nicholas. If you're younger, everyone said Tiger. But no, it, it's hard to not I'd, not a wrong answer with each. Yeah, I think what did Nicholas have? Nineteen seconds in the majors. Uh, mm-hmm. I think in I think in the nineteen seventies he, he didn't finish outside the top ten in, in some crazy stat. I That's think amazing. Better than Woods, I just think he was probably be, better for longer. Yeah, and, and t- tight with the injuries and the, and yeah. the personal th- struggles he went through. You're, yeah, I, I don't think you get an argument there. Um, before we go, you, you're doing a lot of things online. And people, if somebody is in Florida or in Australia, uh, middle of the United States or South Africa, wh- wherever they are around the world, th- they can work with you. But you have a, a, a full in-depth educational system. T- t- tell everyone a little bit about that before you go, because I want them to be able to reach out to you and check you out and learn yeah. from you. Uh, so what I've done, I've got me online coaching for anyone uh, in England. Um, uh, sorry, uh, my one-on-one on coaching. I've got me online coaching for anyone around the world. I do education seminars uh, for PGAs around the world. And I said I've got an app and uh, a project I'm working on at the moment, which I'll release some information in the next couple of weeks. So they can find me in those. And actually, I forgot to tell you, I'm probably doing a golf school in Orlando in January. Oh, I, yeah, I'll definitely try. It's four and a half hours from me. I'll definitely yeah. try to get down and bug the hell out of you. To be arranged, but uh, I think that's the date it's going to be, uh, 19th, 20, 21st. Okay, let me write that down and I'll have that. And of course, everybody will have Lee's uh, his social media info, his, his website info and everything. Reach out to him, especially if you want to get faster, keep up with your friends, pass your friends and brag to them that they can't hit anywhere near you anymore um he's he is the one to reach out to he is one of the world leaders in, in speed development and we're very lucky to have him on thanks Pete. and thanks thank for you having, lee very much appreciated you awesome just if you wouldn't mind just hang out for one second sure. as we sign off here